Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks if I can analyze the mental health and personality factors that may be at work in the case of Andrew Cunanan. Andrew Cunanan killed five individuals, including Versace, a well-known fashion designer. Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. So first I'll look at the background of Andrew Cunanan, move to the timeline of the crimes, and then I'll talk about the mental health and personality factors. So starting with the background, Andrew Cunanan was born in National City, California on August 31, 1969. He had three older siblings. His mother, Mary, was an Italian-American, and his father, Pete, was a Filipino-American. Andrew did quite well in school. He was considered exceedingly talkative and intelligent. His IQ was reported to be 147, so that's over three standard deviations above the mean. There were manipulative traits as well, though, with Andrew. Some described him as a pathological liar. He would tell stories that were incredibly difficult to believe. Claims that he made before he committed the murders included this idea that he owned a plantation in the Philippines, that he owned land on the French Riviera. He said that he was an actor, an importer, and owned a chain of parking lots. I guess stressing the importance of diversity in one's career. If he was going to lie anyway, why didn't he say that he imported land from the French Riviera to make parking lots? Kind of confused people a little bit. In high school, Andrew identified as gay and began having relationships with older men who were quite wealthy. Before graduating high school in 1987, he was voted least likely to be forgotten. Some reports say most likely to be remembered. Kind of the same thing. He also wrote a French phrase in the yearbook. It translates to, after me, the flood. After this, he studied American history at the University of California, San Diego. In 1988, Andrew's father, who was a stockbroker, moved to the Philippines to avoid arrest. He had been accused of embezzlement. Not long after this, Andrew's mother learned about Andrew's sexual orientation. Andrew dislocated her shoulder by throwing her against the wall during an argument. Andrew dropped out of college in 1989 and moved in with a friend and her boyfriend in San Francisco. Andrew survived by accepting money from his wealthy romantic interests and from dealing drugs, namely cannabis, cocaine, and opioids. Andrew started using a number of aliases at this time as well. He would break up with a man named Norman Blockford in 1996. Blockford had been supporting Andrew financially, paying him somewhere between $2,000 and $2,500 per month, giving him access to credit cards, and giving him a car. After Blockford dumped him, Andrew's lifestyle started to erode. He increased his drug dealing activities and increased his use of alcohol, narcotics, and methamphetamine. Andrew started taking an increasing interest in sadomasochistic sex. He stopped dressing fashionably, he gained 30 pounds, and he did not comb his hair. Now around this time, we see that there was some type of dispute between Andrew and a 28-year-old man named Jeff Trail. Trail lived in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Andrew traveled to Minneapolis on April 25, 1997, using a one-way ticket. He stayed with a former boyfriend named David Madsen. The next day, he stayed in Jeff Trail's apartment as Trail and his boyfriend, John Hackett, were out of town. On April 27, Trail told his boyfriend that Trail needed to have an important conversation with Andrew. But when the couple would return to Trail's apartment, Andrew and his belongings were gone. Andrew was in possession of a Taurus PT-100 semi-automatic pistol that belonged to Trail. Evidently, when Trail relocated to Minneapolis, he let Andrew hold on to that weapon. This gun is chambered in 40 caliber Smith & Wesson. This cartridge was pretty popular at that time. Nowadays, it's decreasing in popularity. The FBI had used the 40 caliber Smith & Wesson for a long time, but recently they returned to the 9mm Parabellum. Andrew called Trail and told him he could come and retrieve that gun at David Madsen's apartment. When Trail arrived at the apartment, Andrew beat him to death with a claw hammer as Madsen watched. Andrew rolled the body in a carpet and left it in the apartment. A few people reported they saw Andrew and David Madsen over the next few days. It does not appear that all those reports were credible, 
but it does appear as though Madsen was alive for some time after Andrew killed Trail. On May 3, Madsen's body was found at a lake near Rush City, Minnesota. He had been shot with Trail's firearm. It is believed that Andrew killed Madsen on May 2, but it could have been before that. The police would later find a gym bag bearing Andrew's name at Madsen's apartment. In it, they found a box of Remington Golden Saber 40 caliber Smith & Wesson cartridges, with 10 of the cartridges missing. I guess Andrew forgot to leave the written confession. It seems unusual to me that he would not take all the cartridges. Did he believe that that was discourteous? That he should leave a few for somebody else? When somebody's on a homicidal rampage, usually they want to have as many cartridges as possible. The next day, Andrew drove to Chicago, where he killed a man named Lee Miglin, a 72-year-old real estate developer. Miglin was bound, stabbed with a screwdriver several times, and his throat had been cut with a saw. Andrew took the victim's 1994 Lexus LS, cash, and gold coins. He left the Jeep he was driving behind at that house, and he drove to the East Coast. The Lexus had a car phone installed in it. Andrew used it to make several calls, which allowed the police to track him using triangulation from the cell towers. This information was leaked to the press. Andrew found out about it and ripped the phone from the car. On May 9, Andrew shot and killed a 45-year-old man named William Reese at a cemetery in Pennsville, New Jersey. Reese was the caretaker at that cemetery where the murder took place. Reese had been killed with the same 40 caliber pistol. Andrew stole Reese's 1995 Chevrolet pickup and drove to Florida. He checked into the Normandy Plaza Hotel in Miami Beach, Florida on May 12. He was featured on the FBI's 10 Most Wanted Fugitives list a month later. Andrew would check out of that hotel in July. He made his way to Miami Beach and on July 15, at around 8.45 a.m., he shot a 50-year-old man named Gianni Versace, a well-known fashion designer. Andrew shot him twice, once in the face and once in his neck. Andrew had approached him when Versace was on the steps in front of his mansion. Versace had just returned from a store where he bought a newspaper and some magazines. Andrew fled the scene being chased by witnesses, but he turned around and threatened the witnesses with the firearm, so they broke off the chase. The police found the Chevrolet pickup truck owned by Reese in a parking garage not too far away. In the vehicle, they found newspaper clippings from Andrew's murders. Andrew's body would be found in Miami Beach, Florida, on a houseboat on July 23, 1997. He died from a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. Now moving to the mental health and personality factors. Let's take a look at the potential personality profile for Andrew Cunanan. When I conceptualize personality, I use the five-factor model. I remember the five traits through the acronym OCEAN. Openness to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. So Andrew appeared to have a high level of openness to experience. He was creative. He invested heavily in fantasy. He was intellectually curious and adventurous. He had low conscientiousness. He was impulsive and irresponsible. He had high extroversion. He was talkative, assertive, outgoing, although he may have had few positive emotions. Andrew had low agreeableness. He was not humble. He was not straightforward. He didn't appear to be altruistic. It's not clear if he had a lot of trust for other people. Perhaps he did it one time and that trust eroded, or that could have been a facet where he scored a little bit higher. As far as neuroticism, we see a high level. He was angry, depressed, anxious, emotionally reactive, self-conscious, and had no ability to resist temptation. Now, his personality may have developed in part due to his relationship with his father. Their relationship was unusual. Andrew's father, Pete, gave him a lot of attention when he was young. As a child, Andrew was allowed to use the master bedroom in the house. Pete bought him a sports car when Andrew was 14 years old, even though Andrew did not have a driver's license. Image was important for Pete. For example, he always wore expensive suits, so that may be where Andrew got that idea. When Pete fled to avoid prosecution, Andrew's mother was left with only $700. Everything else was gone or would be sold off to pay Pete's debts. Andrew flew to the Philippines intending to live with his father, but after arriving, he saw that Pete was living in squalor. Andrew returned to the United States knowing the truth about his father, 
but he told his friends that his father was a success. It's like Andrew didn't want to give up the lie. Now, I'm not aware of any diagnosis that Andrew received in his life. There have been many theories about what could have been going on with his mental health. One theory says that he may have had antisocial personality disorder. His behavior may align with some of the criteria for that disorder. After all, Andrew frequently lied, was impulsive, irresponsible, and lacked remorse. But it's not clear if he had behavioral problems before the age of 15, which is required for antisocial personality disorder. Another argument has been made for narcissistic personality disorder. His behavior appears to align with several of the symptom criteria. For example, grandiosity, believing oneself to be special, having a sense of entitlement, being manipulative, having a lack of empathy, and being arrogant. He was described by his friends as loud and obnoxious, which seems consistent with the grandiose presentation of narcissistic personality disorder. So that one seems like a possibility. I think one could also make an argument for certain borderline and histrionic traits as well. From borderline, we see chronic feelings of emptiness and emotional dysregulation, and from histrionic, we see needing to be the center of attention. So Andrew may have had features from all four of the cluster B personality disorders, but what diagnosis he may or may not have had, of course, remains unknown. It also makes sense that perhaps Pete was depressed, and it seems like he did have a problem with substances, so perhaps something like substance use disorder. So that brings us to the question, what motivated Andrew Cunanan? Why did he commit these homicides? I know Andrew technically qualifies as a serial killer, but his behavior is atypical for that designation. Let's take a look at his murders individually, as the motives might be different for each one. The first murder victim was Trail. These two had some type of dispute in the past, as I mentioned. It's not really clear what the conflict was about. So this may have been about money, maybe about drugs, but something happened between them. So Andrew may have been trying to settle some type of score. The second murder seemed to be about romantic rejection. We know that David Madsen had rejected Andrew. So this one could fit into the classic serial killer paradigm. Andrew was hurt by the rejection, so he was going to make that person pay. The third murder, Lee Miglin, is the one that seems to have the most in common with the typical serial killer behavior. It did seem as though it had a sexual domination theme to it. Andrew had wrapped the victim in tape, similar to what he had seen recently in a movie that he rented that featured bondage. Also, Andrew did not know this victim. It's not clear why he selected him. The fourth victim, Reese, appears to have been killed simply for his pickup truck. Andrew knew that he'd been tracked by the authorities, and he wanted to switch vehicles. The fifth and final victim, Versace, seems to be the reason that Andrew went to Florida. It's not clear if Andrew had ever met Versace before. This murder seems to be a play at immortality. Andrew knew that his days were numbered, so he decided to kill somebody in an effort to become notorious. Looking at these murders, we see a different motive for each one. This is highly unusual for a serial killer. Is there one motive that could explain all these homicides? One popular theory is that Andrew thought he had HIV. Now, an autopsy revealed he did not, but his belief that he did may have led to a nihilistic and dark view of the world. It could have caused him to be depressed. Another popular theory is the idea of narcissistic injury. Andrew had been rejected by several people. He could not maintain his upscale lifestyle. People started to see that he was a fraud. So all this comes together, and he simply can't accept the change in status. He couldn't go from being special to not special. So he committed a series of homicides to prove how important and memorable he actually was. Now moving to the last theory. This is the one that I think is most likely. At some point prior to the murders, Andrew decided to end his life. He knew he was going to be checking out, so to speak, and he wanted to indulge his narcissism fully. So in the last months of his life, he did whatever he wanted, killed who he wanted, exacted his revenge, experimented with his fantasies, and then reached a point where he ran out of money, and that was it. Narcissism is a truly destructive personality trait, and it's somewhat like substance use, in that it can be risky to withdraw too quickly. In a short period of time, 
Andrew had to face that he could not live up to the narcissistic fantasies. The narcissistic shield came crashing down. Andrew believed he could not live without it. Those are my thoughts on Andrew Cunanan. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis on this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.